All right, welcome everybody to the July 14th Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee meeting. Uh, it's, I guess we've all gone through this before, but the antitrust policy notice is displayed on the screen. We must abide by that and the code of conduct that is linked in our agenda. Uh, so for the announcements, we have our standard announcement, which is the Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have something that you want to be included in that newsletter, please leave a comment on the uh, wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Uh, the second announcement, uh, the charter changes have been uh, drafted with LF Legal. There's been some additions around just when the election is going to be held um, and just some other clarifications. So I've linked the changes uh, that have been drafted there in the agenda. If there is anything in there that you see um, that is of concern, um, please take a look and uh, let Hart and uh, the Hyperledger folks know um, to ensure that that gets included. I believe that has been uh, added to the agenda for the governing board. We meet on Monday, so I will um, at least have some sort of update, hopefully next week on what uh, comes out of that and whether or not the charter is actually going to change. Are there any other announcements that anybody has? Okay, uh, Bobby. Thanks, Tracy. I just wanted to give um, some of the maintainers on the call a heads up. Um, the task documentation task force might be sending through the Discord a quick survey. It's only a few multiple choice questions, um, but just to keep an eye out for that for each one of the um, projects and tools. All right. Thanks, Bobby. Any other announcements that anybody would like to make? All right, uh, so if there's no other announcements, we did get two quarterly reports that came in, uh, Cactus and Fabric. Um, I saw one question, uh, and I think, Dana, it was a question that you asked on Cactus around whether or not it was a place where we thought the maintainers were ready to take that to get graduated or not. Um, so Peter, I don't know if you I have seen that question yet or not, but uh, maybe put you on the spot and see if you might uh, provide us with an answer. All right, Tracy. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have not seen the question yet. Apologies. I would say we are getting ready to apply for the graduated status. I just want to finalize some details on. The, with the new maintainers uh, from uh, Weaver, the Weaver team. So they are officially Cactus maintainers now, but we're still hammering out the details on that. We, we collaborate on that weekly. And uh, hopefully closer to the end of summer, beginning of the fall, we will have some big updates on that. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Peter. Uh, any other questions that exist uh, for Cactus or Fabric at this point that didn't make it yet into the wiki? Okay. So if there are no additional questions, um, I didn't have any specific TSC topics for today. Does anybody have any topics that we should discuss as a TSC before we talk about the task force? All right, so if there are no um, items that I will hand it off to you, Dano, uh, to talk about the project gaps task force. Cool, let me find which window I was going to share. All right. So I worked on finalizing some of this last night, 
and um, I did share it on Discord. Um, but it's what I call a red herring. Very much up for discussion on some of these details. Um, so if we go back to, uh, I try to work on some of the deliverables. Um, I didn't get to the unfilled needs to solicit projects for, <clears throat> but I focused on the philosophy and listed specific themes areas for the philosophy that aren't currently included by current projects. Um, didn't get a full list of these projects in each area. And then I listed a couple of labs. I didn't look too deeply into the, too many of the labs. There's, there's, it's quite a deep well to look into. So I'll need some help from people who are familiar with those lab projects. Um, but the big take on the philosophy um, is, you know, an elevator pitch and propose a policy change. Um, the first elevator pitch is, is to enable enterprise enabling software for distributed ledger technology and multi-party systems and the frameworks, tools, and libraries that support and enable those systems. So I think the big thing is acknowledging the second part, the frameworks, tools, and libraries, FTL, that we're starting to move up the stack from just the core um, blockchains themselves. And even what a blockchain is, is taking a change. You're, we're now calling them distributed ledger technology and multi-party systems. Um, and I think that's the elevator pitch for you know, what projects we would be looking for. So comments, uh, statements on that anyone wants to make? Any, anything? Yeah, no, Did I as, get it? Go ahead. As I, as I read that, um, I think that that excludes applications in the multi-party system space. Is that intentional? Is that uh, an incorrect read? What, what are the thoughts on kind of the application space? Um, so I did list some um, application support and libraries in the themes. So my thought is that it would probably fall under the frameworks and libraries. I don't know if we necessarily have a white label application, but maybe we should have a white label application um, where you can just go in, change the branding and boom, you're up. I mean, I guess you could think that Hyperledger Explorer in that case was a white label application that you could just relabel it and have your own um, Explorer that's branded to yourself. So I'm open to adding that directly. OK, any other comments? OK, so from this, oh, uh, go ahead, uh, Arun. Hey, Daniel, so can we, so since since you're talking about this topic, right, multi-party system, so I would envision at some point in future, so we know that we are not going to work on um, the standardization things, but however, it would be good if Hyperledger collaborates with other standardization entities. And in some of some way or fashion, it already happens now, right? So uh, there's TOIP and then there's a um, few others that we closely work with, or like some of the projects in Hyperledger has inspired them or what, whatever it could be. So that could also go, uh, when I consider it in the scope of multi-party systems, it could go to entities such as GS1, which right. in kind of, relates to supply chain domain, which goes back and defines the standard entity models for how different parties exchange their data, right? So are we yeah. considering like library tools implementation for those as well under here? I would consider those in scope. And when I went to further down the, the thing about projects and themes and I did HLF is not interested in, I put some commentary on running and operating a standards process. Standards work may run in parallel to a project but HLF is interested in the software implementation and community around the software, not the standards making process. Does that uh, encapsulate the concern or should we tweak that a bit? So it, it encapsulates, however, it leaves a gap around multi-party system definition for application. So we are planning, we are, at one side, we are thinking of leaving out the application domain specific implementations. But when we go for standardization entities like this, it again, even though it's a multi-party system, it deals with a scope specific um, uh, um, entity models, right? So it, it's okay. it's very application oriented things. Okay. Let's see what Nathan and Hart have to say before I look back on it. Nathan? 
Well, this is actually what I liked about the elevator pitch part of this statement is one of the hopes for this for me is that it helps those relationships go both ways. Because just like we have some organizations we like to use as our standards side of what we're doing at Hyperledger, my hope is that we can also become the preferred place for them to build their ledger and multi-party computation components um, and that we can have a closer relationship as a result. So um, I, I, I agree that we should do something to try to clarify or keep um, kind of flexible our definition of domain specific because for a, one of these standards bodies, typically domain specific doesn't mean that it's a specific application for a specific customer. It typically means we don't have the scope to address everything about the problem in the first phase. So we're gonna pick a handful of use cases to start with. And that seems to still fit within the spirit of what we're trying to do. Okay, Hart. Yeah, thanks Dano. I guess one of the concerns is that if a project, particularly if it becomes dominant in a space, may have to do some de facto standards work, even if that is reflected in code rather than, you know, sort of just uh, standards documentation. So um, I think, you know, the, the essence of this point is correct that we don't want to be a, a standards org, uh, but we don't, as Nathan points out, we, we sort of, you know, want to reinforce collaboration um, and we don't want to prohibit our projects from sort of working on de facto standards, particularly if they're reflecting them in code, right? You know, what do we do if say, you know, the cactus ledger connector, uh, you, you know, becomes popular, right? Does that format, you know, do we ban them from writing up a document on that? True. Um, See, when I was this hearing uh, standards process, I'm thinking of stuff like ISO and OASIS. Oh, absolutely. And we don't want that. We, we you know, we want things to be code focused. Um, but, but there's sort of a fine line, you know, between like, there's clearly a big difference between a standards organization and, and sort of what I'm talking about here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but we want to make sure that, you know, sort of projects understand that, you know, uh, that, that if they've sort of created de facto standards, they can run with them. So something like that? That's perfect. I like that a lot. Okay. Um, Kamalish, did this address some of your concerns too? I also see our nose off mute. Yeah, I'm, I'm rereading the whole thing. I was trying to make sure I understand and, and I'm comfortable with what's captured here. I mean, I, the, the, the gist of my, my thought on this is we don't want to prevent specification work to happen per se. We have to be careful not to claim that we are developing a standard, but you know, I, I wanted to react mostly to what Hart just said, but we want to focus on code. Well, yes and no. I, I don't think this should be done exclusively, you know, in the sense I, I don't think we necessarily want to exclude any specification work per se. And as a, as a result or as a parallel activity to writing code, we may very well say, oh, there is an API or there is a protocol, or there is a format somewhere that would be, that could be codified into a specification. And the, I don't see any reason why Hyperledger couldn't get this done within Hyperledger. But, but, we are, but I agree with what you were saying, Dano, that you know, at the same time, we don't want Hyperledger to be, you know, uh, to be claiming that we are doing standards work per se, because the word standards, and you know, I get back on my soapbox on that one, is, you know, it, it carries a lot of weight and it, it has a very specific meaning. And I agree with you, they are formal, 
standards organization that do that, and we don't want to get into that. But there, there's plenty of work that happens before the formal standards processes kick in, and that can be done within Hyperledger. So I wouldn't want to exclude that. Okay. It's very common that formal processes, if you go to like W3C is a good example, right? The, the deed spec is like, well, it, you know, you, you often stop this somewhere else and then you come and say, hey, we want to build a standard around this and you contribute whatever you have come up with, uh, you know, to get things started. So that one thing that you contribute to get things started could be done within Hyperledger. And, and by the way, the Linux Foundation has a process to do this. There's a framework called the Community Specification Framework, which ensures that the right legal commitments have been done and have been secured and all that stuff. So that I okay. think is important to be aware and to make sure people do it the right way. Because the tendency in open source is people think, oh, we have an Apache software license, we're all good. Well, it works well for code, it doesn't work so well for specifications but beyond that that's an implementation detail it's an important one but right so what i have highlighted in the second line i wonder if there's a way we could make this stronger to say brother mayho say please bring your ref reference implementations um is there some way that we could say to invite the reference implementations or should we just leave it at may host uh so I'm I'm gonna have to push back on the word reference because that again has a very specific meaning. Um, yeah, I prefer that. Can I add a reference and otherwise, or just implementations? It can be references or samples implementations. It can be oh yeah. HLF and maybe, invites projects that are maybe it will help if I explain a little bit if I I don't mean to abuse the microphone here but uh, so the term reference implementation although it's abused by many people so you know don't mm -hmm. get surprised if you see it used in a different way than I'll explain but it it really is kind of like um, the cut off law in a way it's like in parallel to the to the actual standard you have a reference implementation which means that if the specification is not completely clear on certain things, you can go to the implementation and say, that's the way it's supposed to work. And, okay. and you know, while a sample implementation doesn't carry that kind of, you know, authority, the specification is the last word. And if there are holes in it, well, there are holes in it, but you can just go to the sample implementation and say, well, that's how it is. <laughs> Somebody might do it differently and still claim they are compliant and they have the right way of doing it. Okay. Jim? Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, just, just from my perspective, I feel like standardization is, the, the space is not ready for a standardization, is my opinion. Um, there's so many innovations and so many new approaches emerging all the time. I, I'm, I'm curious when people say standardization, what, what are some of the threads that are happening? Um, DIDs would be a good example. And that's a big one on identity. Um, I'm not sure if there's any, um, uh, nothing in Ethereum has been submitted to ISO or Oasis, although there was talk of trying to get Oasis in the JSON RPC steps. And that kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, when people realized that they couldn't just argue all day and had to actually agree on stuff. So I, I want to share that there is a whole set of activities around standardization of blockchain and DLTs and whatnot within ISO and GTC1. Uh, you know, I for one, I mean, I'll be honest, IBM has been trying to slow it down as much as possible because very much like you were just talking about, we feel like it's way too early to try to standardize things. And I mean, especially given that they started this work several years ago already, but uh, that, you know, so the work has been mostly at a very high level 
uh, which is often the way it starts is like people focusing on terminology and you know very high level view kind of thing okay yeah uh, i think the idea is a good example uh, but to me that's likely the only example where sanitization is uh progressing uh, uh far long enough um, in all, all the other attempts to standardize things in, uh, from what I've seen is just way ahead of what's, what's necessary at this point. Okay. Do we have any projects that might be an example of this that are implementing a standard um, that has progressed? Probably in the identity space would be the most likely candidate. Is there anything in Aries or um, Indy or any of the others? Nope. Okay. So I'll leave the example there blank. Um, any other comments on standardization? Are people happy with this more or less? I decided to cross out the top line and just have these two bullet points. I think these encapsulate what's been said better than what I initially put. Okay. Let's go back to the top with the elevator pitch. Any questions on the elevator pitch before I move on with it? I think we took a tangent on, on, uh, standards, but I think it was a good tangent. Okay, so so from this, this is probably the most controversial part of my recommendations that are coming up today. Um, and that's been that I'm recommending a policy change. Uh, it used to be in the past that um, when projects came up, um, they either needed to be a layer one DLT or MPS, or they had to support multiple layer ones or MPSs. And I think the time has come where we need to consider policy change where we allow projects that explicitly target only one platform as a part of their feature um, without requiring them to be folded into that one platform. Because there's a couple of things. It might be targeting a platform that is not a Hyperledger layer one, but is still in a space that Hyperledger wants to operate in. Um, but at the same time, um, not every layer one is willing to accept these alternate implementations. Um, so I see Hart has his hand up. So I'll go ahead and let him answer. Uh, hi, Dano. You know, I, I'm not sure this is actually a policy change, right? We've asked projects to have the goal to support multiple platforms in the past, um, but we've had a number of projects come on and then, you know, only support one single platform, right? Um, so I'm not actually sure this is a policy change. I, I think, you know, we've sort of already uh, been doing this there certainly aren't any rules that explicitly say we have to, you know, that, that projects have had to be multi-platform, right? This is something, you know, the, the TSC has encouraged, but, but we've never really had this rule, right? Every um, project pitch that I've seen um, has been targeting multiple platforms. Explorer said they were going to target multiple. Cactus, that's the point of Cactus. Um, Cello, in its initial pitch, said it was going to target more than Fabric and then has pulled back into Fabric, but their charter, the project charter, still um, right. claims they've, more than that. They, they've said this, but you know they really haven't delivered, right? Right. Um, but so, their projects, when they were admitted, came in with the intent that they would go multiple. And I guess the policy change I'm proposing is let projects come in and let them say, oh, no, we're going to stick with Fabric um, okay. from day one, and we don't plan to expand from that. And also, I don't think we have any policy that explicitly says this, right? Right. It's this been, is, it's been practice. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. It's it's been the attitude of the TSC that you're more likely to have your project accepted if you say you'll support multi-platform. Uh, okay. And, and I guess you just want to sort of, you know, formally state this philosophy uh, rather than change any rule. Is that correct? Right. Make 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 the shift in in philosophy formal. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Kamalish, I think you're next. Yeah. Hi, Dino. So uh, as a recommendation perspective, like uh, projects and themes, like oh, as, as a community and the user of the Hyperledger technology, people are I mean, mostly are preferring to some simplification of the users of the project. Like for example, like wallets, example, example, while they are building some kind of tokenization application on top of Hyperledger, they always challenges to uh, having a wallet, whether they, they may need to customize or build something. So having a wallet 
in a in a hyperledger projects in the future is good to have or i think must have i believe and there are similarly there are there are still uh, complexity of implementing a hyperledger technology is uh, is very complex if, if you talk about the like ethereum or maybe like for example polygon or other like quorum there is so much simplification of doing the network setup to tell building application so similarly kind of uh, about about projects and themes that i think already we are mentioning like wallets and secret storage and vaults all is kind of priority and i think other thing like uh, all the audience themes what are the priority we are setting here or uh, it's generic um what was the question on that again I think, yeah, I, so I, think I, I missed some I mean, of it. I mean, like, there are there are a couple of things like the operational support of specific DLT and user focus projects for wallet. So, while we are like suppose this identify this task force as a gaps in the in the in the project. So, uh, what we are accepting uh, in the future projects on some priority basis, like uh, we will consider some uh, having a wallet project in the future, which with a more weightage to be implemented earlier or so any priority perspective. I mean, I mean to ask. um i i mean i mean like suppose we listed a uh, couple of things here in the, the task force like uh, where the hyperledger uh, projects actually having gaps right so i suppose there's a couple of six seven categories so so we are going to accept the, the projects or maybe we are encouraging the community or the open source developer to build the projects in in this particular uh, areas and maybe imp improvise the existing projects so any specific uh, priority in terms of the those themes or oh, i meant to ask that one so does that have to do with the single project policy that we were discussing i'm i'm missing the connection i think in general hyperledger technology not any specific two projects oh would yeah, we I, I... If, I think this ahead, is a different. I think this is a different question, right? I think it's a, do we do we have a priority over which projects come in, uh, first, versus others, right? Like, would we would we say that wallets are more important than, uh, token applications, right? I, I think that's the question. Is it not, Kamlesh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can be like was like like wallet, but the wallet is kind of. Currently, not any standard available in the fab, in Hyperledger or any web, okay. web or whatever. Okay. Um, can we can we discuss that when we get to projects and themes and, and finish the subject on the pol on the single serp on the single ledger policy? I mean, it does kind of get in. Do we prefer ones that are Hyperledger and not Hyperledger? But you know, honestly, I would love to be in a position where we have to pick and choose uh, which one can come in first. That's not where we're at right now. Um, but I, I think that is a good question for the projects and themes once we accept or not accept the explicit policy. So let's go to Tracy and then we'll come back to this if there's no other discussion on it. Yeah, so related to the projects that are focused on a single platform, I, um, I think there's a couple of things here that trigger for me. Uh, one is the discussion that we previously had in the TSC around project families. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one that we've had a long time ago on sub projects within a project. Um, you know, so I think when the Hyperledger initially started, we had the Fabric SDKs as separate projects from Fabric. Um, and we got to a point where we actually ended up, I don't know, probably a couple of years ago having a decision where we decided that those were no longer top level projects. They were projects that fell under fabric. And mm -hmm. so I think there's this, you know, uh, question about what, when we talk about projects focused on a single platform, what is the level of scope that we have there? And I, and I think the second sort of trigger that this had for me was a discussion that occurred on the chat right before Explore went end of life which was somebody put on the Fabric channel um, a question about Explorer. And I said, well, you should ask that in the Explorer channel because that's where the people are that are going to be able to answer that question. Um, 
and uh, I got back this response that was such that like, well, Explore only supports fabric, so why wouldn't the people here in fabric be able to answer that question? And I was like, well, right. you know, I, I can't, <laughs> you know, I don't have an answer for that, but uh, go talk to the Explorer folks, right? Um, so I, I think there's uh, a challenge that we have. I think those are two challenges. The third trigger I had was um, how big does the landscape become? Um, so for example, let's say, let's just use the Explorer example again, right? We actually do have, we had the Fabric Explorer, we had a Sawtooth Explorer, we had an Aroha Explorer. Um, Sawtooth and Aroha's Explorers fell underneath those projects. Uh, and the Fabric Explorer was obviously Blockchain Explorer because that was the first one, first project that was accepted, right? Um, but the Sawtooth Explorer and the Aroha Explorer never really got, uh, you know, uh, uh, advertised to the wider world because they fell into the source base, you know, uh, under mm -hmm. Satu Theory Roja, right? It might have been a separate repo, but it was, you know, the same people were, were dealing with that. So, uh, you know, if we get to a place where, again, we have uh, six different or five different uh, DLT platforms and we have an explorer for each, does that mean we now have five different extra projects uh, all called, you know, something explore or do we say that these are actually sub projects or part of the project family of fabric or Satit or Iroha or um Besu or etc right like I, I right. just I and I, I think Besu think is a great we, example yeah Go so I, I think that we just have to have some sort of limit limitations here right like I don't think I can just open up my mind and say yes I'm going to allow that Although I think it's a great idea, but yet there's some triggers that happen, and we have to understand that you know there's some um, some perceptions that people have when we when we talk about these different projects. Okay, and yeah, Explore is kind of interesting because yeah, it kind of fragmented, and then some code bases accepted it and subsumed it, and some didn't. Um, but I think you know, basically, never was um, terribly interested in Explorer because there were a lot of other open source explorer projects that covered Ethereum. Um, Blockscout, I think, is the one that typically got installed in a lot of it. And there's a lot of single purpose ones that were outside of, of Hyperledger. And so the functionality of, an, of a block explorer versus a project of a block explorer, you know, is I think is the one that straddles the line very much between is it core or is it not core. Um, but I'm thinking stuff like, like Cello, which is more orchestration, that puts a different philosophy on the way you organize your nodes versus the way you might not want to do it. That one may not be is more on the independent rather than the core side because it's it's more opinionated than how you might want to do it. You know, um, like you know the classic JavaScript uh, UI things. Is it MVC? Is it MVMC? You know, all those other you know approaches. Do you use React? Do you use all the other stuff? Um, so that's why it wouldn't get pulled into the core of the JavaScript language per se. But it's a definitely only targets JavaScript. Um, so I think we do need some some parameters on this. And my thought is that we put something along the phrase of the project community should be large enough to become self-sustaining independent of the platform. Would that get to the core of the issues? Uh, so it might. Uh, I, I don't think it addresses all of them, um, but it, it might. I, I think the other piece uh, that you triggered just now when you were talking about language is that we initially accepted Iroha because it was a C++ DLT, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, would we accept Project X written in C++, written in Rust, written in Python, written in JavaScript, written in Go, written in, you know, and have every single language be a separate top level project. I, at this point in my life, I, I would probably say I'm not happy with that. Um, and that mm -hmm. wouldn't be a, a reason, a good enough reason to say, yes, we should have a separate project. OK. Jim raises his hand. Yeah, um, I think my head is kind of in a similar place as Tracy. Uh, it's not very clear to me. Um, uh, for a project that's only targeting a single platform, first of all, I, I do think that's uh, that's a viable 
policy change. Uh, but what's not clear to me is, um, do we continue to, to just have uh, top level projects versus not? Um, because <clears throat> uh, the implication to the level of uh, hyperledger resources that will be put behind them will be different, right? Um, uh, or do we need to create a new uh, sort of project tier that accommodates very good, very useful top level um, projects, but not, you know, not a, a large scope one that would enjoy the, the, you know, the marketing resource and everything uh, that a typical top level project will have. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. So, so what I'm hearing is there's there's not consensus that we should do this, um, and there's probably deep issues that need to be thought out online, possibly, or at least over a week or so. So, I'm going to mark this as no consensus and table it, and let's move on to the projects and themes, so we can get some more coverage on that. Um, I think Kamalesh's main question was, what's the relative priority in order? And this list is different from my first synthesis list, and I thought I did. And to, to his point, I was putting this kind of in priority order of uh, things that I think are more important um, on top of the things we'd be more aggressive in soliciting. But everything on the list is still gain. Um, low level DLT MPS libraries, I mean, they don't, they're not like, you know, they're not crawling out of the woodwork. You really have to hunt them down. But the right one that comes in, there's totally a home for it. Um, and, you know, you don't know you need these until they show up for the most part. But everything else above this, I think this is the relative order of where I heard where the needs were coming from, from the various uh, party holders. Um, so the first one is, you know, there's a bit more need for operational support for these platforms, um, things to, to monitor. And some of these are arguably just features that the platform should implement, but some of them could be separate. Um, Cello would be an example of like an orchestration support for these systems. It's very opinionated about the way it's set up. Firefly kind of fits into this, but not really. It's more of a framework or it's, it's its own thing for the most part, but it might provide, you know, that's something that can be built into a into an application framework like Firefly. Um, outside the DLT world, um, actually uh, the application support in libraries would be more like the, uh, the Ruby on Rails type stuff. I don't really have, no Ruby on Rails would fit into any of these specifically. But, you know, projects like Ruby on Rails might have their own integration and things like uh, Rails. And uh, Spring might have some of their own integrations for some of these. Um, a second one that I heard very high that I almost put on top above these, these two are two really close, are end user focused projects. Um, things like wallets and vaults um, for, for individuals and for enterprises to contain their keys and to communicate with the DLTs in an automated or, or uh, on, on request basis in credential storage. Um, I think that the, uh, the growth of, of identity keys um is is an undercurrent um that is growing and could become you know one of the top features uh from from a from a project it could become one of the uh one of the one of the stealth stealth features that's gonna gonna show some real value um cross-chain interoperability, interoperability is always big um cactus is doing great um but there are more ways that people might want to do interoperability um they might want to do uh token-based uh atomic swaps for frameworks for that they might want to do um all sorts of level of interoperability. They might want to interoperate with enterprise systems. There are some labs projects um, that are doing things like HLF connector, where they take the stuff off the blockchain and they put it in Kafka queues. Um, those are some of the sorts of interoperability that I think are, are rich that aren't necessarily part of the core. Um, and then as we get lower down, these are these are important and valuable spaces in the future that we need to move into. Um, but I didn't hear, you know, like clamoring from any of the uh, any of the operational networks, but you know, they they uh, they, they seem valuable uh, long-term space to have stuff ready for enterprise applications as the field matures. Um, one of those application supports and libraries, this would be um, the sorts of libraries that you would use to build your dApps, um, you know, like a, like a Ruby on Rails for dApps or some other thing. And these are the features that probably would be, when I had the policy change in mind to support explicitly single platform projects, this is the part on the stack where I was thinking that they would be most valuable is the ones further away from the, the DLT itself that are separated um, by some access libraries that do things that on the application level. Um, so perhaps an NFT app that only targets um, Aroha 
uh, might be one that might be a top level project that doesn't require any core changes to a ROHA. Similarly, UX libraries that support Fabric in a particular style at the front end um, that only explicitly intends to support Fabric, I think, um, could provide value as a project. So this and the next one are where I think that the single project libraries, um, single, single platform libraries have the most value. And the last next to last one is domain specific toolkits. We already have one in um, Grid, um, but I think there's areas in things like Providence, in uh, intellectual property management, and in operating exchanges. Um, but not, you know, wouldn't Hyperledger wouldn't operate an exchange, but they might provide white label software that if you wanted to, you could, if people were willing to bring that as an open source software for their for their types of things. And finally, there's always room for the low level DLT MPS libraries that are reusable across DLTs or that explore um, new novel space. Um, one example that's always brought up that we have never quite been able to, to pull off is a common consensus library and a common consensus interface. So that you could have, um, if you implement this interface and you have a new fancy consensus library that is you know, some sort of an asynchronous, uh, some an asynchronous library that'd be really cool to put in things, you can just implement the interfaces in your blockchain and in the consensus and things will magically start working. So I think there is opportunity there, um, but it's gonna take some work for sure. This is the general ordering I think of, you know, what if, if we had to pick and choose an order and prioritize, I think this would be the order. But I honestly think um, we just take them as they come. Um, and finally, the non-interested, and I think it's as important to say what we're not interested in as much. And these have, have been, except for the standards, have been fairly non-controversial. These first two are pretty, pretty well accepted. Um, Hyperledger is not going to operate a specific network. Um, and I put Ethereum mainnet in here as an example. Basu is a client that runs on Ethereum mainnet, but it is not running Ethereum mainnet. And I think that's the sort of space that the projects would want to operate in. Um, in Hyperledger, um, projects that, that that work with and service the network, but Hyperledger is 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 uh, unassociated with the project with the network governance as they can be. Um, and then hosting a specific application, for example, we wouldn't set up a block explorer for Ethereum mainnet that's run by Hyperledger. That's something that would be out of scope. Um, Hyperledger might host a block explorer software, and and some company could stand it up and run it their own. Um, but Hyperledger itself would not expose that service to the public. And finally, um, operating the formal standards process, we had a little bit of a sidebar on that already. And I think I'll drop this first line and use these two, that you can be de facto standards, but if you're formal, it's not HLF is the wrong place for the formal process. And if you have an implementation of a formal standard, HLF is a great place for it. So Kamalesh, did this address some of your concerns when we were talking about single project? Yeah. Okay. Jim. Hey, just want the, the list looks great. Um, just want to uh, propose maybe a slight tweak. Uh, I feel like the, the world doesn't need uh, new token projects, but the world definitely needs a viable confidential token uh, projects. There are many uh, efforts around this, well, a, a few efforts around this, um, none of them are widely adopted, but I do see a lot of re um, requirement for that. You know, the many CBDC projects around the world that are you know, coming online in the past few years, I, f I, f I would bet all of them would end up needing something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and about NFTs, can we um, qualify specifically what we're looking for for NFTs? Because tokens cover NFTs, I, I assume NFTs we're talking about maybe a marketplace sort of thing. Um, 
one of the things in NFTs is people say, oh, there's utility for this. And I think that could be true. Like say, if you have a NFT that represents the ability to moderate a Discord room and you can pass that around from person to person, um, you know, how would we do that? I think is one interesting use for you to, for NFTs. Still have your hand up, Jim? I'm done. Nope. Thanks. Daniel. Okay. Yeah, we don't need a, a Hyperledger profile picture collection. Don't know of any enterprises that would need a PFP for all their employees. Okay, um, if there's no other questions on that. The last step is labs projects. And this is where um, it was pretty uh, late for me. So I only was able to identify two good top ones. And I'm sure there's other ones because getting into these labs projects is kind of deep. Um, Solang, I think, is one that would be interesting. We might want to ask them to come up again. Um, they had pitched a couple of years ago, and I think the problem was they only had one active maintainer. Um, they now in their project list three and their commit logs support that claim. And uh, what I think is interesting about it is it's supporting, and this goes into my elephant in the room point at the bottom of this, um, it supports delaying substrate NIWASM um, for, for doing solidity <coughs> for, for those things, for those uh, platforms. Tracy? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, uh, Sean had reached out to me to ask me about what it would take to bring this back. Uh, to the TSC for incubation. He asked me that a few weeks back. Um, so I would expect that to show up here soon. So I think you're on the right track uh, in thinking about Solang as possibly a top level project. Um, okay, cool. Because he, he also mentioned right the, the expansion of um, maintainers to that project and contributors to that project. And I definitely see a lot of discussions ongoing in the, the Solang channel in Discord. Cool. Um, another project was Perun, which is confidential channels across multiple blockchains. It's got plugins to support that. Um, does anyone else have a favorite lab project that they think should be uh, uh, discussed with to bring up to incubation status? Tracy. I don't know about incubation status, but I, I have been doing um, in preparing some slides, looking at kind of top 10 most active labs that we have. Um, the other one that exists uh, between Solang and Perun that is top 10 is a business partner agent, which is an SSI waller and controller. Um, so uh, then I also think there's uh, Orion, which is a centralized ledger um, that has quite a few uh, pull requests that are happening in there as well. Um, and then there's some some fabric specific stuff uh, that's going on. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if they're at the state yet of wanting to come to incubation, but at least as far as pull requests, um, they filter to the top. Okay. Um, do you have the specific fabric ones that might, or should I just go to labs? Uh, so there's a there's a private data object uh, that is, I believe, uh, fabric based, uh, confidential, preserving off chain, says off chain smart contracts, but I think it is based on uh, some of the fabric stuff. Uh, there's the Fabric Operations Console, um, and I think there's maybe some ongoing discussions around whether or not that uh, filters to a top-level project at some point or not. Um, okay. And then the Fabric Smart Client is also another one. Um, but yeah, th those are kind of at least falling to the top 10. There's actually one which is Fabric Operator, and there's like a whole bunch of different operators. A hot can talk to this. I mean, he actually, you know, made the effort of listing them all. And we've been trying to start an effort towards some convergence. But I don't know that this would become, that any of those would become a top level project because they are very fabric specific and have no, you know, no claim of ever being more than that. Okay. Hart, have your hand up. 
Yeah. So, um, I, as Arno points out, I, I did go through this. I think we have something like 12 active and 23 uh, total uh, labs that focus on fabric operations. It's it's a huge number, um, and we are working to to try to streamline them. Um, but it looks like from a sort of fabric maintainer perspective, uh, the fabric maintainers seem to think that they would prefer, you know, sort of whatever comes out of this, uh, you know, fabric operations collaboration, that it be sort of as part of fabric in a, a separate repo rather than be its own project. Um, so, so it seems like the maintainers here might be happy to incorporate this into fabric in some form uh, rather than become a, a top level project, uh, which is why I didn't initially bring this up. Okay. Uh, and any fabric maintainers on the call, uh, although I think Arno is the only person I see. Okay. Can clarify more, but yeah, we, we've been working on this. We've had discussions. Um, this is kind of a, an embarrassing amount of fragmentation in our space. So, um, yes, no, but I agree you, you, what you said is accurate and, you know, IBM, the truth, I mean, IBM, uh, as you hot knows, I mean, you know, we've only contributed the fabric operator and just so that everybody knows this is about Kubernetes operators, which is a key element of actually doing, you know, deployment of fabric network in Kubernetes because there wasn't one as part of fabric everybody created their own. IBM had developed one as part of her uh, uh, proprietary offering, and we have now contributed that to Hyperledger. I believe it is the most advanced. It's uh, production ready. It's been in use for many years. And so, but we didn't want to just submit that as part of like Fabric. We could have contributed to Fabric directly. We tried to play the card of, being open and and inviting others to participate in this effort so we first contributed it as a lab and now we're working with others and you know i have to thank hot to nudge everybody to try to work together on this so that we would work towards uh, having one really uh, awesome operator that everybody could use okay um i think nathan's had his hand up for a bit um I think this is just a bookmark for an issue we might need to come back to, which is that seems like an interesting and very useful graduation option of instead of something going from a lab to its own project, going from a lab to joining an existing project, I worry we might have some back doors or some checks we normally do when a project leaves labs that we might miss if a lab moves in that other direction. But it seems like for a community and collaboration standpoint, it'd be good for us to communicate to projects that that's, or to contributors that that's an option and that it works well. So we'll call it labs exits. Just to add to that, uh, Nathan, I think that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's what's happening right now with uh, Cactus and Weaver, right? And bringing in uh, pieces of Weaver, the Weaver lab, um, that IBM contributed to Hyperledger Cactus. So I definitely agree that I think, you know, just because something is built in labs doesn't mean that at some point it doesn't go into an existing project um, or alternatively become uh, its own top level project like Ursa did or Cactus or Bevel, right? Um, so I think there's multiple ways of, you know, kind of <laughs> using the word graduated, but uh, graduating from labs, right? Um, exiting labs is probably the better way of saying that. I mean, if I may add, I mean, this was very much the intent of having the labs in the first place, right? To create some kind of ground for people to, you know, start the effort with that necessarily much pretension, but with that possibility of being ready to move to a project whether on, as Tracy says, whether on its own or as part of an existing project.
Okay. Any other comments for Lattice Projects? So one thing I want to finish with, this is a little bit out of the scope of um, project gaps, but I think it's an opportunity and a potential threat we need to think about. And that is what is Hyperledger's public network story. I don't know that we have one. I don't know that we need one or do we need one, but it's something that I think we need to put in our minds. I'm, what brought me up to this question was a few, uh, about a month ago, I was watching uh, one of the um, one of the various uh, Ethereum podcasts, not podcasts, uh, conferences is going on. And Ernest and Young uh, demoed a supply chain operation built entirely on Ethereum mainnet. Um, and that brought to my mind that some enterprises may want to operate entirely on the public network. Um, and I think that is something that Hyperledger needs to um, decide how they want to operate with, with public non-operated networks. There's kind of a foothold with Basu um, as far as Ethereum mainnet. Um, but the question there is, do we want to fully commit or, you know, how do we want to interact with this? What's our approach? And I have no solid answers for this. It's just something that I think I need to put in our minds as a technical steering committee as to what we should do with it. Jim. Yeah, you know me, I, I've, I've always advocated for more integration with uh, layer one, uh, but in the approach where um, a permissioned walk garden is is uh, running as a side chain where the majority of the transactions is happening and either through token bridges or through some sort of roll up, which by the way, I think the UI demo is is using a roll up technique. So there's, yep. there's a layer two that's running uh, with zero knowledge proof. Um, so I think from what we've seen, uh, it, it's, it's becoming a, a very useful pattern uh, to use permission chains as a side chain, but there is a way for, for value to flow inside and out of uh, with, with a layer, layer one. Um, so I would definitely encourage the for us to evaluate more in this, in this space. Yep. Maybe a gap we missed. And I'll let Hart have the last word because we're almost at time. Yeah, I totally agree that this is something worth investigating. And I have promised people on this call that you know I, I will do some work on this. I know I owe Grace, among others, an email about this. So Grace, expect an email from me hopefully soon. Um, but yes, th this is definitely uh, you know something that I think at least we need to we need to figure out you know more about and what we should be doing. You know, when we started Hyperledger in 2016, uh, there was this general attitude among our member companies that that they were going to completely stay off the public chain. Uh, and I think that has has changed a lot. Um, so I would actually be curious to hear what, you know, a, a lot of people think about this um, and, you know, what sort of involvement in the public chain is, is the community's appetite. I would, I would suspect it's a lot more than people think. Cool. All right, thanks, Hart. So I think we're at time. So those are uh, the findings of the task force. Thanks. All right, thanks, all. Thanks, Dale. See you guys.